Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of a bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello everyone, we have a great new episode of History Hack for you today, um, which will particularly be perfect for those of you interested in women's history, Georgian history and also heritage interpretation. So we're exploring the fascinating history of the Georgian Thameside Villa Marble Hill and its first owner Henrietta Howard, who lived between 1689 and 1767. Joining us today are English heritages Dr Megan Leyland and Emily Parker. So I'll introduce them briefly before we get talking. So Megan is a senior property historian and Emily is landscape advisor at the charity. And Megan and Emily are the authors of the new English Heritage Guidebook for Marble Hill, which has come out this year. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having us. Yeah, hi, lovely to be here. It's an absolute pleasure. So we're going to deep dive into um, an overview of Henrietta Howard as a person and why she wanted to build Marble Hill in the first place. So if Megan, you wanted to, to give us a bit of an overview. I can indeed. Well, Henrietta Howard, later Countess of Suffolk, is a really fascinating, complex woman who overcame a great deal of personal adversity to become a central figure in Georgian court society. And as a person, she's actually quite hard to pin down in many ways. And I think that was, in some ways, part of her talents as a, as a courtier. Um, which she became through during her life, and also part of her talent in, in navigating the difficulties in life. The writer and politician Horace Walpole described her as of a just height, well-made, extremely fair, with the finest light brown hair, it was remarkably genteel and always well-dressed with taste and simplicity. And he continues to describe her character at points as grave and mild, but that she was discreet without being reserved. And we actually have quite a few contemporary descriptions which give us something of a sense of Henrietta as a person because she was well known in Georgian society. You know, the poet Alexander Pope says, I know a reasonable woman, handsome and witty, yet a friend, not warped by passion, awed by rumour, but grey through pride or gay through folly, an equal mixture of good humour and sensible soft melancholy. But as with any historical figure, you get lots of different views on her in the past. And I think, you know, her biographer Tracy Borman says it quite well that she's enigma today as she was for her contemporaries. And I think we can really find something of Henrietta and who she was as a person in her actions and in her life and through understanding her life biography. And what is revealed through getting a sense of her story is a woman who was tenacious, determined, intelligent, who never gave in and really resourceful. She was perceptive. She herself had written, I am famous for my penetration and observation. But she was also a woman who had experienced great loss, sadness and points of relative hardship in her life. As you've said, Beth, she was born in 1689 into a noble family who were somewhat impoverished, the Hobarts. And she spent her early life at Blickling Hall in Norfolk. However, by the age of 12, she had lost both parents and was orphaned. By the age of 16, she had married, but it was a disastrous marriage to the ill-tempered and drunken Charles Howard. It was an abusive marriage. And so she was in really desperate circumstances. And I think this is a bit of where Henrietta's sort of character comes through. She didn't give in. She travelled to the home of the future kings and queens of England, Hanover in Germany. They'd, um, in Hanoverians would inherit after the death of the reigning monarch, Queen Anne. And she found favour with that family. And that, again, is testament to her, her charm, her intellect, her ability to navigate social situations, her gift for friendship. And when she returned to England in 1714, when George I ascended to the throne of England, ushering in the Georgian age, she found herself a position in the household of his daughter-in-law, um, Princess Charlotte, and soon after became mistress. Very difficult situation, stuck between two people, to Princess Charlotte's husband, um, George, the Prince of Wales. And so she's in this sort of precarious position at court, and she becomes noted for her diplomacy how her ability to negotiate this situation, she's called the Swiss for her apparent neutrality while at court. And it's at this time, while at court in 1724, that she begins building Marble Hill. 
And I think from that story leading up to it, you get a real sense, perhaps, of why Marble Hill was so important. This was a house she built, a house of her own. So, you know, since her childhood, she hadn't really had much stability. She'd lost her parents, as we heard. Her marriage and her awful husband meant that she was constantly moving from lodging to lodging because he was always in debt. There were always creditors looking for him. She lived, you know, in hungry at points, in fear of him. She didn't really have a settled home. Then she came to court and she was moving around with the royal family. But in building Marble Hill, a home of her own, for the first time in a long time, she had, you know, a sense of security. And what's really important, I think we'll come on to it later, is this was a home which was hers and not her husband's. So I think to really understand Marble Hill, you have to understand how she got there, the rough journey and her tenacity and determination in forging a better life for herself continually, um, you know, as she goes on that journey um, from childhood through to court and then through to having a home of her own. That's a perfect introduction for Henrietta, for any listeners who haven't come across her story and so far or haven't been to Marble. So we're going to go on to um, looking at Marble itself, getting an impression of Marble at the time it was built and, and what else was in that environment. So I wanted to go on to next, um, talking about the the fact that Marble was one of several villas on that stretch of the River Thames. I mean, what would this view have looked like and who were Henrietta's neighbours? Yes, yeah, a really good question. Um, in the 18th century, this stretch of the river developed a really distinctive character. It was described at one point as an earthly Elysium, so the paradise of classical antiquity, in Twickenham as a classical village. Eight echoes of ancient Italy could be found in its flowing river. And increasingly in the 18th century, villas inspired by the architecture of the 16th century Italian architect Andrea Palladio started popping up in between more commercial developments which still existed along the River Thames. And in 1760, Henrietta Pye, um, so it gives a lovely sort of description of the area, the whole place is one continued garden and the genius of the inhabitants incline not towards commerce, and ar but architecture seems their chief delight. And it's important to remember that in the 18th century, I mean, I think we think of that sort of part of London as London, as more urban, but really that was the country then. This was a place you could retreat from the hustle and bustle of central London, from court life. You could hop on a boat and you could go down the river and you could find some sort of peace and quiet. And you've asked a bit about her neighbours. So really, this was a place which was densely populated um, with sort of aristocratic, political, artistic people. It had a real sort of artistic culture situated there. There were lots of writers. We've got royals not far away at Hampton Court or at Richmond Lodge, where the prince and princess spent their summers. And so it becomes a real hub for people interested in conversation and creation and garden design and architecture in particular. And one such writer who lived there was Alexander Pope. Now, Alexander Pope and Henrietta Howard were good friends. And it may be, and it's quite likely, in fact, that one of the reasons she wanted to live there was because Pope was there. She had a friend already there. He had a villa. Um, doesn't The main villa doesn't survive now. The grotto does. And he painted this wonderful picture of tranquility, which must have sounded amazing, stuck in London, navigating this position in court and thinking, wow, I would love to go there and be part of this. And she had quite a few friends who lived within the area. Catherine, Duchess of Queensbury Kitty, who was this fantastic witty lady and a, a patron of literature, lived over the river. She inherited the property in 1725. Archibald Campbell, Lord Elay, an advisor of her, had wit and place not too far down the river. And throughout her life um, on the river, she made new friends, such as Horace Walpole, the writer and politician who came to the area in 1747. So Henrietta really did put herself at the heart of an interesting location, not only because of that sort of continued garden, the design and aesthetic of it, also because of the conversations that took place there that she became, you know, an important part of. I wish we could just go back to that time when marble was built and just see that whole um, Thameside community of aristocrats build up and just see all their amazing houses and um, yeah <laughs> it's just it would have been such a sight. You've mentioned the um, Andrea Palladio um, which goes on very well to our next question which is about what and who were the influences on Marble Hill both in terms of the house and the gardens and how did marble compare with the fashions of the time? I think this leads on quite nicely from what Megan was saying about what they were trying to create in this area or the feel of this kind of Arcadian Thames, this kind of harking back to sort of ancient uh, Rome and ancient Greece in this kind of 
uh, Elysian fields, perhaps, on this stretch of the Thames. So what they're doing in terms of garden design in this period, and Henrietta Howard's garden is at the forefront of this, is trying to hark back to some of those ancient ideals. So they're trying to create a, a villa, which Megan will talk about in a second, which has these sort of ancient roots. And they're also trying to create gardens that sort of match that idea. And Megan mentioned Alexander Pope. Uh, he was one of the forefront people of this kind of move in garden design at the time. And his uh, and the garden is sort of influenced by him and involved with him. But I think we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, so what did an ancient garden look like? So what is this fashion on the ground? So it still had sort of strong central uh, axis. It still had quite a strong feel and design. But they were starting to bring in things like winding paths through areas of woodland. They were bringing in ideas about beauty and utility. So having your um, kitchen garden right next to your house, for example, which is something that Pope did in his garden. And also having uh, very, what I call obvious, uh, ancient features such as grottos, which have their basis in what they thought ancient Romans used to have, and then they were brought back in Renaissance Italy. And also things like amphitheatres, so having these kind of ancient theatres features that they're recreating in their garden. So what we have at Marble Hill is a lot of those features being put together to complement the villa and the house and to make these areas feel very much like a ancient setting, an appropriate ancient setting for that villa and building. Yes, as Emily said, um, really the, the house and garden is something that we're really keen to do um, when we've been working in Marble Hill was really designed as one. You know, it's the setting and the building that goes in. And like the garden, um, the house itself was inspired by sort of um, the sort of design ideals of ancient Rome, sort of codified by Adriano Palladio. And they're things such as symmetry, proportion, using classical elements. And you see that in the facade of Marble Hill with the pilasters up the front and it's all in proportion and it and it's a very satisfying <laughs> building to look at and a very beautiful building. And it was um, sort of the, the fashion at the beginning of the 18th century to build in this Palladian style. So Henrietta was very much on trend and she spoke to and conversed with people who were influential in design at the time. Emily's talked about the gardens, but we see this in, in the building as well. She consulted the architect Earl, Henry Lord Herbert, to um, help design. Roger Morris was a builder who had been, um, whose master had been Colin Campbell, who's um, one of the foremost advocates in the 18th century of um, Palladian design, classical design. And I think it's it's really important to also note that when they created these buildings and these properties, it was very much those collaborations, conversations between people within Henrietta's network and herself. Um, we know that she had an interest in architecture and, you know, she had plenty of opportunities to learn about it through reading, through court. She subscribed to architectural publications. And so really what she created um, is this, as Emily said, this incredible building and garden which harked back to these sort of really early ancient ideas um these ideas of what these buildings were in the past so very much on trend and Henrietta was um one of a group of elite women who um were involved with with building um works on their estates and and I can't help but think of Jemima Marchioness Gray um connected with another English heritage property Rest Park and it was she inherited Rest Park through her family. And when she was married to um, Philip York, she, you know, still had control of Rest. She was still very much involved with her estate. And he had another property um, that was more connected to him. How unusual was it that Henrietta actually was involved with building her own residence? Um, and yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question and a really good point. And Henrietta was quite unusual. She was in quite an unusual position, being able to build a home of her own whilst married and a home which actually her husband had no rights over. I mean, it was a really bold step. She was in this abusive relationship, this horrible marriage, and her husband was constantly after her for money and her property and things like this. And she went and she built something of her own. And a good question, how was that possible? And um, the reason we ask how was that possible is because in the 18th century, upon marriage, 
women's legal existence sort of was suspended. It disappeared. They all their property, everything they owned became that of their husbands. So in theory, you know, as a married woman, how does Henrietta get to this point where she can build something of her own? And I think, you know, scholarship has really shown that in spite of the law, the theory in practice, elite um, women uh, did in the Georgian era engage in building works and design. We've talked about Jemima, who you've just mentioned, and that is very much dependent on the relationship to the property and the relationship of the marriage. But there are also ways you could sort of legally get property of your own as a woman if you had money, connections and the right people to help you do so. Um, And so Henrietta, throughout her life, um, certain uh, men in her life tried to protect some of her wealth during her marriage and also when she inherited later from her brother-in-law. But important for the construction of Marble Hill is a gift from uh, the Prince of Wales um, in 1723. And though we don't know a great deal about how she used that gift, when she sold bits of it or not, it's no coincidence. I don't think that Marble Hill started being built very soon thereafter. And this gift contained um, things such as jewellery, furniture, but more substantially, £11,500 of shares in the South Sea Company and the Bank of England. And as um, many of you may know, the South Sea Company, um, we have to recognise that it did trade in slave people. Um, So there is that other side to this this conversation story, which um, we won't have time to go into today. But this gift gave Henrietta the financial and personal um, freedom and independence to build Marble Hill because the prince had been very specific in how it was to be used. He had a written sort of settlement which said that she could have this, but it was basically free from any control or any interference um, from Henrietta's husband. He said, It was a gift to the end, intent and purpose that some provision and way of living may be made for the said Henrietta Howard, with which Charles Howard shall not have anything to do or intermeddle. So this was hers and hers alone. And anything that she sold or any property that she bought with it, again, was hers and hers alone. So this was put in a trust um, with male trustees, um, again, to further protect it from her husband. And then they could use it um, for the benefit of Henrietta. And it's, you know, it's quite clear sort of getting that background that this is to help Henrietta set up home, to gain a degree of independence. And, um, yeah, it really started a new beginning for, for Henrietta, having that security. She was still at court during the time when it was being built and for much of the beginning of um, Marble Hill after it was constructed. And I think it's important to note that while Marble Hill was being built, Henrietta did actually legally separate from her husband in 1728. And again, just like building a home completely free from a husband like that was quite unusual. Separating was as well. There was a lot of pressure to stay in marriages in the 18th century, whether they were good or bad. She didn't quite get a divorce. She got a legal separation, which was something used by sort of high status couples to try and keep it out of the courts, to try and keep it out of the public eye. Though I think um, the discord and estrangement between Henrietta and Charles was very much known (laughs) but she separated so that was a really important part of beginning that life and so for Marble Hill this was her home and I think Horace Walpole says it quite lovely it was Fair Howard's elegant retreat it was her retreat from court from marriage from previous troubles and it was that sort of way of passing on property that gave her separate property for her and her to own alone. I think it is worth picking up a little bit on the Jemima comparison Beth because that is a really interesting one so when I was thinking about this uh, the other day I was thinking about what the kind of differences are between Jemima and Henrietta so Jemima and Henrietta are similar in some ways so they both consulted directly with designers in Jemima's case she was talking directly to Capability Brown and she was getting involved in what he was doing at Rest Park Um, for both of them it was kind of their garden so, as you said, uh, Jemima inherited it from her grandfather and she inherited the t- his title as well. Um, so and it was separate from her husband. Her husband had his own property at Wimpole. So whatever Jemima did at rest was sort of her own decision making, although she did work with her husband on some of it. And both of them were part of a circle who were very much known about design and taste. So they are very similar in lots of ways. And I think we're quite lucky at English Heritage to have two very interesting women in the in the 18th century to be able to talk about in terms of design and garden design. But I think what's different, and I think 
this is what makes Henrietta Howard perhaps a slightly different uh, story, is that Hen- Henrietta Howard didn't inherit anything. She was building something from scratch and using that tenacity and that s- skill that she'd got to create her own home and create her own place to sort of have separate from her court life and from her husband. Whereas Jemima's is very much sort of inherited and it was just continuing keeping that garden and that house going with changes. But I think that's the kind of what makes Henrietta Howard particularly fascinating is that she's building her own home and it, she's re- and it gives us a real opportunity to see what her taste is and her design and what she wanted. Whereas other you know, women of that time were perhaps inheriting and adapting existing things. That's a really important distinction between Jemima and Henrietta in that regard. And what's also becoming clear with our conversation is, is just how important Henrietta's circle were to her, of her friends, of the court, in, in her life and in enabling her to, to build Marble Hill and to build this, um, I don't know if we'll quote this elsewhere, but I'm thinking of the Alexander Pope quote, Megan, about there being a greater court at Marble Hill than at Kensington Palace at the particular time he um he uses that um phrase and yeah Henrietta's um group that kind of brings us on quite nicely to how um as you mentioned Megan it was quite common for the elite to consult their friends while planning the designs of their homes and gardens and Alexander Pope who we've mentioned was involved with the original designs for Marble Hill's gardens as your archival research Emily during the Marble Hill Revive project found. Could you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so before I start going on about Alexander Pope, who I think is an an incredible connection for Marble Hill, and some of the research that me and Megan did about that was really exciting, I think it is worth just uh, sort of hanging on to the point you were saying about it being a group of people involved with this design. So Alexander Pope is perhaps the most significant of them, but she was also getting advice from Lord Ile, who Megan talked about in terms of her um, uh, trustees and her involved with one of her friends she was also probably getting advice from lots of other different people and I think that one of the people that we don't necessarily talk about and I think before I go on about Alexander Pope is that she was also getting advice from other women and I think this is particularly interesting for Marble so she was uh, for her grotto we know that she was getting advice from other women who decorated grottos in the 18th century and specific practical advice. So how to stick shells onto a grotto? What cement should I use? How should I, you know, how should I do this? Like physically do things like that. And I think that that is quite interesting in terms of sort of women to women design and grotto decorating is a, a women's pastime in the 18th century. There's quite a cult of women doing this kind of work. So I think that was just interesting as a kind of side point that it's not just Pope, but Pope is the one that we did quite a lot of really interesting research on. So he is worth sort of chatting about. But yeah, the other things came up as part of this project, which put her in the centre of quite an elite circle thinking about gardens and design at this time. So yeah, Pope's, we did know about Pope's involvement uh, before the project. So before we started on this sort of batch of research and we knew they met on site. So we have this lovely correspondence that talks about uh, Alexander Pope meeting with Henrietta Howard and Charles Bridgman. So Charles Bridgman goes on to be royal gardener. He's what we would call a professional garden designer in the uh, 18th century. So he is someone who he does plans, he does the works, he sorts it out, he will produce you a garden, you know, to a certain what you would like, what you would like, what your design would be. But Alexander Pope is perhaps more of a theorist. He's perhaps more of an ideas man. He does get involved in designing his own garden. So he designs that. And he also gets involved in designing the gardens of his friends. So he's involved particularly at somewhere uh, at a place called Prior Park in Bath. So he gets involved in bits of design, which is quite interesting. However, what is fascinating about Marble Hill is that we have a design. We have a garden plan, which through this project, we've been able to attribute directly to Alexander Pope. So it was actually Megan who found the sort of clinching bit of evidence for this, that um, which was uh, sort of scraps of designs on the back of his Odyssey translation. So from being able to find little tiny bits of sort of uh, plans on the back of his uh, other works, we were able to match them to this garden design for Marble Hill. So we could confirm that it's Alexander Pope's hand that created this 
plan. And then plan, it, it's fascinating what it comes, what it tells us about Marble Hill, but also about what it tells us about garden design more generally in that period and Pope's ideas and Pope's theories. But so Pope's involvement is really fascinating. We were able to sort of pin it down much more through this research. So yeah, I think we know about Pope through this plan and his involvement there. We know about it because he's mentioned in the archives. So things are done by the order of Mr. Pope or by, you know, by his sort of direction. So he's obviously kind of involved on the ground as well. And I think we can definitely see it in the stylistically how the garden evolved over time. So the theory goes that Alexander Pope probably gave her ideas. They met on site. He drew up a plan. And then Charles Bridgman turns it into a much more practical garden design that was actually carried out. So it carries through a lot of uh, Pope's theories on garden design, but it's much more practically laid out by perhaps Charles Bridgman and on site. Picking up on that thread, Emily, about women collaborating together in ideas for gardens, for example, um, brings to mind the fact that Marble Hill, although notable as a place of intellectual meeting and conversation, you know, Henrietta, as some of the neighbours we've mentioned, some of her circle we've mentioned, were from politics, from the arts, but it was also a domestic space at um, various points in Henrietta's life. And you mentioned the grotto there reminds me of her um, great niece, Henrietta Holson, who she put shells on the grotto with. So yeah, it'd be good to chat a little bit about um, the domestic life as such of Marble Hill as well. It's so true. It's really easy to get caught up in that incredible social circle she had and those network of people. Actually, Marble Hill was a place of family life. It um, was a place where children lived at points throughout Henrietta's life. And so you can really take this slightly different angle on it and I think what a place for a child to grow up amidst that circle you'd certainly learn about society um living with Henrietta Howard wouldn't you and all the people who coalesce there and the Henrietta family must have been something that was kind of greatly wanted and something that she'd lost so much of throughout her life she'd lost her parents she lost siblings she had been in an abusive relationship she had a child of her own Henry by her marriage with Charles Howard, but they were estranged. Um, women didn't really have rights to their children in this period. We're looking later down the line when uh, when that comes about. So, and she never reconciled with her son. And that didn't stop her though from creating a family at Marble Hill, like she created her home to live in, like she created this new life for herself. And I think what was really brave about Henrietta in many ways is that she didn't give up on this. So she built started construction marble here in 1724 she was still at court in 1734 she left court hurrah at last she's no longer caught between the prince and princess then king and queen here the prince of wales became king in 1727 she's gone and now she can finally enjoy this home that she's created and she decides to share that with someone she marries um in 1735 george barclay who was a politician and shared a lot of Henrietta's interests. And I think at the time, not everyone could quite understand why she, why, why was she remarrying? Why, why, why him in particular? But when you read her surviving correspondence with George, it becomes quite clear. This was a genuine, affectionate relationship. Love, maybe, quite possibly. You know, she calls him my life, my soul, my joy. And they have this wonderful bond together. And they live at Marble Hill and she has a London, central London home, as well as many elite society did at the time, um, Savile Row. And they went on trips to the continent together. They entertained this grand circle. You know, as you said, Alexander Pope said there's a greater court at Marble Hill than at Kensington. You know, they're entertaining on a great scale. But sort of to add to that life at Marble Hill, children appear, not Henrietta and George's themselves. Um, her niece and nephew, John and Dorothy, um, come to live with, with her. And you get a sense of, as Henrietta calls it, their little family um, and how they enjoyed Marble Hill. And there's, I, I love, there's a letter between Henrietta and George where they're talking even about parenting. You know, how, how do we parent these children who are running riot? And George encourages Henrietta to take on the office of rebuker with Dorothy. She's getting away with too much. So they have this life at Marble Hill. They're, the children probably had rooms on the second floor and Henrietta and George had symmetrical complementary suites of rooms um, on either side of, of the house, you know, with a bedchamber and dressing room. Um, so you get that that sort of family life there as well. And once 
John and Dorothy had all grown up and very sadly George died in 1746 after 11 years of happy marriage. Henrietta once again gets another young companion and probably a very welcome companion in the 1760s um, who must have kept her great company and you know bought this whole new lease of life which is as you mentioned Henrietta Hotham and when we were doing our work on Marble Hill for the Marble Hill Revive project, we presented, uh, represented her bedroom and put a bed in it for the first time. We haven't had a bed in there before. We, it was and presented differently originally. And we put in a dressing table, which shows you some of her interests, such as helping her old aunt, as she called her, decorate the grotto. And there's this just fantastic letter which um, Henrietta Hotham writes to her parents. So her mum was Dorothy, that niece who came to live with her before, and her uncle was John. Um, so um, that's how they tie into the family. She writes this letter and she talks about how she enjoys dancing, doing impressions, spinning and doing all those kind of things that you'd expect a young lady to do, helping with the grotto. But you do get a sense of her boisterous nature. And there's this fantastic bit in the letter where she refuses to wear a gown and shift the bed. And she said, I don't want to do it. I prefer the naked truth. And then they compromise on wearing one um, and not both. So, yet yeah, Marble Hill was this great place of aristocratic entertaining and of intellect and culture. And it was also a place of family, of a new beginning, of a sort of new chapter in Henrietta's life that, that was filled with family. Um, so it's actually really quite heartwarming <laughs> to hear that side of, of her life coming through. Absolutely. And the, the other side, of course, of aristocratic life in their homes are the, the staff who work for them, the domestic staff. So I wanted to dive into a little bit um, about the fact that Marble Hill once had a servant's wing. Do we know very much about the domestic staff who actually lived and worked at Marble, whether in Henrietta's time or afterwards when others lived there? Yes, yeah, a really good question. Marble Hill did have a, a, a service um, wing. It was an L-shaped wing which came out from the west side of the house, which was uh, demolished in 1909. Sadly, it's it's not there for us to see anymore. We do know a bit about it from an inv inventory taken at Henrietta's death, which sort of inventories list the rooms and the items which are in them. And it's been a great documentary source throughout understanding Marble Hill, writing the guidebook in the project. And it indicates that the, you know, the kitchen expected would have been in there, the laundry, servants' hall, a steward's room and a footman's room. So you can kind of begin to get a sense from that and also later plans for its demolition of what that space would have looked like. In terms of what we know about Henrietta's servants, we don't have any documents which says, here's a list of who was in her service, here's you know, exactly what their roles and position were. We don't have accounts of how much they're paid or things like that for Marble Hill. But we do get these glimpses of her servants um, throughout her lifetime. And I think that's both in the documentary sources, but it's also to remember, important to remember that though that service wing was where sort of some of the living of, of the servants was, they would have been going glimpsed, like in the documentary sources, throughout the house, facilitating this lifestyle. For example, in Henrietta's bedroom, you've got a hidden, hidden door, which is sort of concealed it doesn't look like it's there you can imagine her maid servant coming in or a lady's maid coming in helping her prepare for the day in terms of what we know about this sort of household staff um just to give one example we've got glimpses of a few um there's a mrs susan and she comes up in a letter um from pope as we've mentioned quite a lot throughout this um conversation while henrietta was absent from marble hill and he says mrs susan offered us wine and then he goes on and says flesh and fish and the lettuce of a Greek island called Cos, which would have undoubtedly been grown in the garden at Marble Hill. And Mrs. Susan potentially is a Susanna Graydon mentioned in Henrietta's will 30 years later. And it wasn't unusual for people to stay in service for that length of time. And she's given a bequest of six pounds a year. And there are other people mentioned in the will, such as a footman, Thomas Hurd, her second husband's servant, John Finch. And other hints of maids and things and other documentary sources, nurses who help look after Henrietta Hotham. For Mrs. Susan, however, what I have missed is what her job potentially was. Well, she was most likely the housekeeper, which was um, the sort of highest female role in the house who'd have been responsible for looking after all the other female servants um, in Henrietta's employment. And it seemed likely that she might have, you know, done a bit of kitchen stuff as well. In terms of grand country houses, Marble Hill is actually 
a small smaller suburban villa still big still big for me to live in um but it would have been a relatively compact household so that gives you a sense of the household stuff but we do also know something about the garden stuff which emily um you can say a bit more about yeah so we're very fortunate in the garden that we have sort of three sort of contracts for looking after the garden so these are written uh, during Henrietta Howard's lifetime and they describe the kind of jobs and tasks that the gardeners should be doing throughout the year um, and in one of those contracts we have a head gardener name so Daniel Crafts who was the head gardener it's undated so we're not quite sure when but sometime in Henrietta Howard's lifetime he was the head gardener what's interesting about Daniel Crafts is that he was also Lord Ely's head gardener who we've talked about before who was one of Henrietta's trustees and he was definitely her his head gardener in 1761 so there's definitely some kind of crossover of gardeners and garden ideas and things with the head gardener kind of moving around between them, perhaps, in that period. Um, the contract also tells us how many other gardeners were employed. So we know there was five gardeners working there most of the year, but only three in the winter, and that they were paid eight shillings a week. So you have a little bit of that sort of detail. And we also gave a detail about what they'd be doing for that eight shillings. So they'd be mowing the lawn, cleaning weeds from the gravel paths, being responsible for the planting, keeping it watered and well looked after, as well as duties in the kitchen garden. And I think that the sort of kitchen garden one is particularly interesting because we have records of what she was sending to her townhouse in Savile Row. So, you know, that they're the kind of people making the functioning of this kind of mini estate because it's not, a, as, Henrietta, uh, as Henrietta, as Megan was saying, it's not, it's not a big, huge estate with lots and lots of productive gardens and, um, you know, uh, land for uh, different sort of cattle and sheep and things it's quite smaller in scale it's kind of very much a domestic scale whereas that kitchen garden was probably working quite hard to sort of feed both Henrietta and her family when they're at Marble Hill and when they're at their townhouse in Savile Row. No, it's brilliant we have these these glimpses of both the garden and the um and the, the villa staff and um, where there is obviously it'd be amazing if we had even more about and um, to learn more about their lives but it's brilliant that we do have some glimpses there and remaining with a the theme about um lost spaces there were also and um, there are also some spaces in the in the gardens at marble hill which were included in the original designs they were built but they don't actually survive today what can you tell us about these emily it's really interesting because i think this brings us into a sort of slightly later history of marble hill which kind of feeds back into this so in 1902 marble hill becomes a public park so the whole of the landscape becomes open to the public, uh, you know, 24 hours, you know, all the, all the day, every, every day of the year. And the house becomes sort of a sort of subservient to that park. So it becomes a kind of custodian's sort of lodgings where the people and they had a cafe in it. And, you know, it becomes very much a public park. And as part of that becoming a public park, I think they felt that there was probably too many buildings to maintain in the landscape that weren't sort of working for the, you know, its new purpose. So they actually demolished. So Megan said they demolished the service wing, but they actually demolished at that time several other buildings, which kind of very much told that key story of the garden. So, for example, there was a greenhouse, which was in the garden at Marble Hill, probably built of, well, we know it was built of wood rather than stone, so quite transitory, but it was quite of a key garden and a very a key garden building and a very key sort of vista in the garden. And we know that Roger Morris, who was the builder architect of the house, was paid £200 in 1724, 20, 1728 to build four buildings in the garden. So we know that Roger Morris was involved with the design of those buildings. We know they're probably classical uh, in style because of Roger Morris's involvement, but also because they're shown on a later 18th century plan in a very classical Palladian style architecture. And these include an ice house seat, so like a garden seat that would have sat next to the ice house uh, in the garden. Uh, the uh, china room, which is a room that Henrietta used to display china, which was a standalone building uh, that then was amalgamated into the servant service wing. Uh, and also possibly the grotto. So the grotto is interesting as a sort of garden building because it was lost in the 1830s, 1820s, 1830s. Uh, and then it was rediscovered in the 1940s and then again in the 1980s. Um, and then we did a, quite a lot of archaeology on it recently and it's been recently, the setting of it has been restored. But the grotto itself was a lost building, which I think is quite interesting because it's quite fundamental to the park now. But at, at one point in sort of the 
you know, in the 20th century, none of these buildings were there. It was very much seen as a sort of public park, although the structure of the historic landscape remained. But it's just a shame that those buildings were gone. And we have little hints about how Henrietta would have used some of these buildings. So for the greenhouse, uh, we, there's a lovely letter which talks about her uh, resting her lazy limbs on the sofas of the greenhouse. So there's kind of these sort of hints of how these buildings were kind of fundamental to how Henrietta used and enjoyed the garden. Um, but we don't have a huge amount of other sort of documentary sources that tell us about them in that much more detail, sadly. It's so fascinating to think about these lost spaces. But we're going to return for our final question to the spaces which are, are still there, which we can we can still enjoy when we visit Marble Hill. I wanted to ask you both what your thoughts would be on um, Marble Hill's main historical significance today. I'm sure we've gone into that a bit, but anything else you wanted to mention about its significance? And also, what highlights you would recommend that visitors can experience when coming along to Marble Hill today? So for me, the significance of Marble Hill is really clear to see in terms of its design and through the conversation we've had. It's a really important example of a house and garden. But I think it's also really important to say that it's really significant as a house built for and by a woman, a woman who fought very hard for her independence, who created a new life and who overcame many challenges. And I think it's the understanding of Marble Hill within that life biography, how it ties into um, obstacles which women faced at the time, obstacles which Henrietta faced on a personal level at the time, which I find um, really fascinating and really important um, when we're thinking about, you know, what's important about and significant about Marble Hill. And for me, in terms of highlights, well, I'll leave Emily to talk about the garden, which certainly is a highlight, but it's wonderful visiting Marble Hill now, seeing the interiors that we now have, um, which we haven't had before, an introductory space to tell that story of Henrietta Howard, and that you can walk into it and experience Marble Hill and the sense of what it was like during her lifetime, the people who lived there, the way she used it, the family members who came to reside there. And you can really get that sense of journey from her early life to this sort of triumph at the end, a home of her own. So I think what Megan was saying about the garden and the house being a particular sort of design of a sort of set piece of time, I think is particularly interesting, particularly for the garden. So it's a, it's significant because it's a survivor on this section of Thames where not many other houses survive. It's as interesting because it's a survivor of a particular time period. So it's a time where these changes in garden design are happening really fast. And Alexander Pope's influence on the garden is particularly uh, significant because we don't have many other surviving gardens of his the design or which in which he was influencing um and i think that as part of the project and the new work that we've been doing recently the garden has been transformed and the park has been transformed because it's now reconnected to the house not only sort of physically through the restoration of the garden and planting avenues and trees but also in a kind of intellectual capacity we've reignited the stories and put them back together as one whole estate and how Henrietta Howard was using both house and garden and how she was thinking about them as a pair. And I think that is one of the most sort of significant things that we managed to do as part of the project. In terms of visiting today, and uh, I think it's important to mention that the house is free, the, the landscape is free, it's all free to enter. So it's a brilliant visit. We've just closed for the season, but I think it's re it'll reopen in March or in the new year. And the highlights to see in the new year would be uh, the flower garden so uh, in part of the garden we've reinstated a new flower garden which is based on 1720s ideas which is quite uh, a unique and experimental thing to do so there's something interesting in how how we're going to do that and come back and see what what we've tried to do there there's also the grotto which is looking very different to how it used to do and is very impressive uh, in terms of its sort of structure and how it's now looking and I think the one thing that we haven't mentioned and which links back to what Megan was saying about this being a family home is that Henrietta had a nine pin bowling alley installed in the garden. Uh, so somewhere to play uh, nine pins, which was a very popular game, but not a very usual thing to have in gardens at the time. So you can and we have a sort of replica garden uh, nine pin. So you can play nine pins on the uh, nine pin alley. So there's lots of sort of highlights and things to get involved with in the garden as well. Fantastic. 
So um, as I mentioned, yourself, Meg and Emily are the authors of the new English Heritage Guidebook for Marble Hill. So any listeners um, interested in checking that out, which I'd very much recommend, you can go to um, english-heritageshop.org.uk and search under the guidebook tab. I'll also um, give you to anyone who I hope you are um, invigorated to go out and visit Marble Hill, go and see it. Um, if you go to also the English Heritage website, english-heritage.org.uk slash visit slash places slash marble dash hill. That's a mouthful. <laughs> so do go there and you can um, check out Marble Hill and find out all the information about visiting there. So yes, do check out those, um, those pages, check out the guidebook, go and see Marble. It really is stunning site. And as Emily said, you can check out all the opening times on the website as well. That just leaves me to say a huge thank you, um, Megan and Emily, for giving up your time to chat to us today. It's been really fascinating to talk about Henrietta and Marble and English Heritage. So thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for talking, Beth. That's really lovely. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.